The Seven Years' War is often described as the true First World War. The war was waged in India, West Africa, both Americas and in Europe. Apart from Oceania, all continents saw significant fighting and significant consequences thanks to the war. The French colonial empire was now gone, paving the way for Britain's future as the largest global empire in history. Meanwhile in Europe, Prussia had, through skill but mostly luck, managed to avoid partition by the other great powers, proving that Prussia had the military potential to be a great power itself. But this British victory was by no means guaranteed, as these maps should clearly show. The three European superpowers of Austria, France and Russia stood together against just Britain and Prussia. France had one of the most formidable armies in the world, and in our timeline, Prussia was just months away from collapse, only being saved by the death of the Russian Tsarina, meaning that Russia left the war and even started to provide support to the Prussians, from where the European war was turned around into a stalemate. By just making a minor change and having Russia not leave the conflict, Prussia would surely have been defeated. The colonial war is slightly different, since the French were on the back foot here. The Royal Navy was superior to the French one, meaning that Britain had a large advantage in supplying and fighting this worldwide war. But even here, it's not impossible to see France and Spain, with their worldwide allies, coming out on top on the local battlefields. So today, we'll be imagining a world where France and its coalition of superpowers managed to defeat the upstart powers of Europe. Possibly putting France in a position to expand their colonial holdings, and Austria back in a position of power over Central Europe. We will have the war start in the same way as it did in our timeline. The British and French colonies in North America start skirmishing, after which the war starts to escalate into a full-blown war across the world. We will discuss this war continent by continent, starting with Europe. In Europe, the war was mainly between Prussia, Austria and Russia. Initially, the Prussians, with monetary and military support from the British, fought against the three superpowers in an extremely impressive manner, pushing the Austrians back, throwing the French out of Germany and holding the Russians off. But Prussia had one major issue. They just didn't have the means to keep the war going indefinitely. Every soldier that Prussia lost was one that Prussia couldn't replenish, while the Austrians and the Russians have seemingly infinite soldiers to keep throwing at the war, grinding the Prussians down to a near breaking point. But as mentioned before, in our timeline, just as everything seemed hopeless for Prussia and Britain was demanding Prussia started considering surrendering, Tsarina Elizabeth of Russia died, leaving the throne to Peter III, who was such a big fan of Prussia, he did not only leave the war without demanding any territory, he even gave Russian soldiers to Prussia to continue the war with, allowing the Prussians to push back the Austrians, saving Prussia from losing the very rich Silesian province, or worse, complete partition. We will simply not have this Russian switch happen in this timeline. Elizabeth either dies a few months later, or the war goes slightly worse for the Prussians, causing them to collapse just a few months earlier. Either way, the defeat of the Prussians would mean the end of the European theatre. Soon after, France and its allies occupy British Hanover, and Austria and Russia, now having nothing to gain from fighting Britain, leave the war happy with their successes. But across the world, the war continues between France and Britain. Here we need to once again discuss the British naval advantage. The Royal Navy simply outclasses the French one, something which the French kings very much recognized in their war strategy of our own timeline. The goal for France was to under-defend their colonies, but win the war in Europe, then trade back British European territories in exchange for colonial holdings. For France, this colonial war was not one where it expected to take massive amounts of British colonies. For France, this war was about defending what it already had. With the Royal Navy so dominant, we have two options to allow the French to have a victory. We could simply have France obliterate the British fleet, taking naval supremacy and forcing a victory that way. But this is extremely unrealistic, and not even something the French were planning or expecting to do in our own timeline. Instead, we would have France simply execute their plan of our timeline, attempt to win the war with their military superiority in Europe, while hoping their colonies simply hold out against the British. So, the first colonial conflict we'll discuss is the North American War. Here the French are at a massive disadvantage, even without the Royal Navy. The giant, continent-spanning French colony of New France we just saw on the map has an astounding population of 70,000 people, including native and colonial populations. In contrast, the 13 colonies had an estimated population of 1.5 million at the time. If we are being fully realistic, especially if we are allowing the British Navy to remain dominant, 
the British would eventually manage to sweep across the underpopulated French colony. But for the sake of this scenario, let's assume that while the Brits do make a bit of progress, the French send just enough soldiers to their colony that with the help of their allies they manage to hold off the bulk of the British offensives. Then we have India, where we have a similar analysis as in North America. Thanks to the British naval supremacy, the Brits have a major advantage in combating the undersupplied French there. Here, however, the French have a massive advantage in their alliances on the Indian subcontinent, mainly through their alliance with the Bengalis. If France can keep the Indian empires on their side, and those Indians have a bit more luck in their battles against the British, it is not difficult to imagine Britain simply losing the war in India, massively diminishing their influence there. Finally, there is the minor point of West Africa, where in our timeline the British, with their naval superiority, looted the French outposts there. We will still have this happen in this alternate timeline. So, all in all, this is the status quo of this alternate timeline. To put a bit more pressure on Britain to make peace, let's also say that Portugal is having a tough time against the joint Spanish-French armies. From this position, both sides start to seek peace. For Britain, their presence in India is destroyed, and rebuilding that through money and diplomacy during peacetime makes a lot more sense than risking a naval invasion now. The North American front is a stalemate, and it will take the British significant investment to break that stalemate, which the Brits don't consider to be worth it. While finally in Europe, Hanover, the homeland of the British monarchs, is occupied by France, and Portugal is struggling against the French and Spanish forces. For Britain, negotiating a fair peace deal and returning to peacetime is very much worth it. For France, their calculation is even easier. They have won in literally all of their objectives. They won in Europe and India, they have held their colonies in North Africa safe, and thanks to the British Navy, they can't hope to take any more land anyway. So, ending this costly war is beneficial to both sides. The final peace deal would be mild on the British. Apart from losing Hanover, they are still in a fine situation thanks to their naval supremacy. Hanover would be returned to Britain in exchange for any occupied North American lands to be returned to France. In North America then, the British would be forced to recognize New France and both sides would gain some land as contested lands are negotiated over. While this may not look like the great French victory some of you were expecting, this is pretty much exactly what the French kings were hoping to happen during this war. This alternate Seven Years' War is seen as a largely insignificant conflict, at least when compared to how enormous the consequences of our own timeline were. The Seven Years' War was really a war where Britain and Prussia, at the time two European underdogs, attempted to break the hegemony of the traditional European powers of France and Austria. In our timeline, both managed to do just that, with France losing all of its significant colonies and Prussia getting massive bragging rights and keeping Silesia. From this war forwards, all the way to the world wars, you can say that Britain is definitively the single strongest European power, while the once strongest European nation of France was left licking its wounds. In this alternate timeline, the Seven Years' War would simply be an affirmation of what was already known. The centuries-old great powers of Europe, France and the Habsburgs, both managed to defeat their upstart rivals. Britain was by no means crippled following this war, and it can even be argued that thanks to their colonies and navy, they are still in a better long-term position than the French, but the French have now shown that their status as the dominant European power is not unearned, and Britain will have to work harder to break that French dominance. But while the French and the British rivalry will simply continue after this war, the Austrian-Prussian one will not. As a result of the war, Prussia would lose the very rich Silesian provinces to Austria, the seat of their kingdom, East Prussia, to the Russian-controlled Poland-Lithuania, and likely Pomeranian territories to Sweden. Even if Prussia's armies continually innovate and be consistently better than any other great power, it's simply too small to ever be able to contest with the other big players, and Austria would continue to dominate the other German states. Much has now changed across the world, and much like the war itself, we will go through the most direct consequences continent by continent, finishing off with the general future of the scenario. So, let's start our analysis where it all began, North America. Apart from sorting out some border disputes, the map has barely changed. What has changed, however, is the attitude of the British colonies. In our timeline following the end of the war, the literal millions of British colonists now had the freedom to spread west as they pleased. But then, the British started taxing the colonists, which in their eyes was unjust, resulting in the American Revolution as we know it. In this alternate timeline, the situation, for now, would remain calmer. 
the British colonies are boxed in with a common enemy between the British and the colonists, the French. The Americans would still get influenced by Enlightenment ideals and desire more autonomy, while Britain still starts to tax their colonies more following the war. But with the French threat on the border, revolution is a much less appealing prospect, as neither side would want to see the Catholic French making use of the chaos in the British colonies to invade and control the land themselves. In a similar vein, the Americans would likely not have any allies if they do start their revolution. In our timeline, France had already lost their North American holdings, meaning that they had little to lose by helping to create an independent American state to weaken the British. In this alternate timeline, France's considerations would be significantly different. Say the French helped the Americans break away. Great! Following the war, the young new state with its millions of inhabitants would set its sights on the underpopulated French colonies that surround it. Without French backing, it's even possible that the Americans simply lose the conventional war part of the revolution. But don't tell any Americans I said that. In this alternate timeline, for France, having Britain control the 13 colonies is preferable to an independent America. Since France could, just like it did in the Seven Years' War, occupy British territories like Hanover and start to negotiate a peace deal from there. Meanwhile, a war with an independent America would mean that France has to send their armies over to the continent, leaving them very exposed to supply issues. It is likely that despite tensions, the Americans and the British stay together for at least a couple more decades. Then we have India. In our timeline, the Seven Years' War allowed the British to conquer Bengal, one of the richest areas of the world, as well as kick out the French presence in the south. The following decades were spent by Britain consolidating their position, and they were now practically the only European power on the Indian subcontinent with a massive staging point for future conquests, leaving open the door for the future British expansion we saw in our timeline. But even without full colonization, just controlling Bengal and most of the Indian trading routes gave much economic benefit to the British. In this alternate timeline, the French holdings in India would be much more modest, since they relied on the Indian states to win. The following decades would likely see France strengthening their position in the south of the subcontinent, but don't expect the French to go on a massive conquest spree anytime soon. The French, undoubtedly, have a nice position in the south, and several trading ports across the coast, but don't count out the British. With British merchants and the Royal Navy intact, there is nothing stopping the British from simply negotiating a return to the continent with local rulers. There are only two ways for France to prevent this, controlling India themselves or building up a navy strong enough to continually threaten the British out of India. Neither of these are likely to happen or sustainable for the French, meaning that only a couple of years after the end of the Seven Years' War, the Brits would have already returned to the Indian subcontinent. But finally, we have the continent with the largest changes, Europe where we will now discuss the importance of Prussia's demise. Prussia has gone from a rising power, ready to compete with the Austrians, to a relatively minor German state. It is even possible that since Prussia now no longer controls any land in Prussia, the world reverts to calling it Brandenburg. But the disappearance of Prussia is crucial for the future of Eastern and Central Europe. They were the one state that could act as somewhat of a counterbalance to Austria and Russia. It was the Prussians who suggested that the three powers divide up the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth between themselves to prevent Russia and Austria from going to war over who got to take what from the falling Ottomans. Without the Prussians, it is very possible that the Austrians and the Russians start to race each other for territory in the Balkans, soon leading to war between the two powers, with Poland-Lithuania, Germany and the Ottomans caught in this Eastern European power struggle. But that's just the immediate consequence within a couple of decades of Prussia not existing. But thinking further ahead, we have Prussia's role in stopping Napoleon, the resulting peace deal, and the post-Napoleon world order. The very existence of Prussia provided the only realistic unifying state for Germany, as the Habsburgs didn't have the political capital or willpower to push for German unification with their large multi-ethnic empire. For the Habsburgs, having Germany divided and loosely aligned with Austria was good enough. Removing Prussia means that, assuming everything else goes the same, there is no easy state that the German people could turn to to answer their calls for unification. Then we need to discuss France, which, as a result of this war, is disappointingly similar to our own timeline. An economically weak, conservative, absolutist state. Their economy would be a bit stronger thanks to Indian and North American trade, but realistically, France would still slowly spiral into debt, albeit slightly slower. 
as France's political and economic system is still dominated by nobles and clergymen who enjoyed major privileges and paid very little taxes, while the enterprising French merchant and proto-capitalist classes were repressed and bore the brunt of government expenses. But despite these high taxes, the French military and the expensive tastes of their monarchs and nobles were still too much to cover, meaning that over time debt and taxes continued to burden the nation. As Enlightenment ideas start to spread and France spirals further into debt, it becomes increasingly clear that France's victory in the Seven Years' War has by no means prevented the issues they face in our own timeline. But there is one more drastic event that would push France further down the road to revolution in this alternate timeline. Because, in my opinion, one thing that isn't considered by many alternate historians when discussing this topic is the very large chance that within a few decades a new war would simply break out. The British, with their naval and economic advantages, can still defeat France in India, with more luck and better diplomacy. The British colonies in North America are still much more populated than the French ones, and it's likely that these British colonists would start a new colonial conflict with the French within no time. In Europe, the Austrian-French-Russian alliance has long since collapsed, since the only thing holding them together was the Prussian-British alliance. There is no doubt that the loss in the Seven Years' War was a setback to British ambitions, but I don't see any realistic way that we can cripple the British enough to not have the British simply attempt a round two. This second war would likely focus a lot more on the colonies, assuming that Britain doesn't get Austria on their side. And apart from me, as a storyteller, forcing France to lose the Seven Years' War as a starting point to a scenario, I don't see how Britain, with their naval supremacy and completely safe homeland apart from Hanover, doesn't eventually just strangle the underpopulated and undersupplied French colonial empire into submission. So, perhaps disappointingly to many, the map at the end of this scenario looks very similar to what happened in our own timeline. But remember the many subtle changes between the two. Prussia is still destroyed, with all the previously discussed consequences that brings. Beyond that, while the British were still victorious in this global struggle for power, they have succeeded decades later than they did in our own timeline. This takes away decades in which the British profited from their victory and consolidated their power across the world. Another important thing to note is the North American continent. The American Revolution has been delayed for decades, meaning that different people are fighting a different war for different reasons against the British. Meanwhile the French, enjoying the economic benefits of their colonial empire for longer, may just be in such a better economic situation that the revolution is delayed slightly. This may not sound like a big deal, but a figure like Napoleon was by no means a necessity of history. Even changing the timing of France's revolution slightly could have prevented the rise of Napoleon. Not to mention the extremely different European geopolitical situation if Napoleon does rise in the same way. All in all, despite the French victory in the Seven Years' War, the idea of the Enlightenment were already spreading and all the pieces were on the board for an American and French revolution. In my humble opinion, the British Navy ensured that eventually the British would come out on top in the global struggle for power against the French. In the major through line, this alternate timeline would not be radically different in regards to Britain, America and France, but the details have been changed in such a way that I cannot even predict more specific changes than I have done here. So for now, I will end the scenario here. Let me know in the comments how you think the scenario develops from here. If you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing for at least one more alternate history video every single week. To help the video grow, consider leaving a like and a comment. It really helps out against the algorithm. Even just commenting something simple like hi helps the video out massively. Again, thank you all for watching and a special thanks to these patrons who helped me dedicate more time and effort to the channel by supporting me monetarily. To help the channel and get early access to videos whenever I complete them myself, consider supporting me there. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.